All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar hosted by the 21st Century China Center here at UC San Diego. I'm Samuel Choi, Assistant Director for the Center, and thank you so much for joining the discussion today. The webinar will be recorded and available on our website, china.ucsd.edu. Please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to submit questions, and I'll be reading the questions you submit for our speakers during the Q&A time at the end of the presentation. Today, we're so delighted to have Orville Xiao, who is a longtime friend and collaborator of the 21st Century China Center. Orville is the uh, author Ross Director of the Asia Society Center on US-China Relations, and is one of America's most accomplished sinologists. He is a former professor and dean at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. And he has published 11 nonfiction books about China over the last four decades, and is spending the hour with us today to talk about his debut novel, My Old Home. We're also lucky to have one of our most beloved professors here on campus, Paul Pickowitz, who is the Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History and Chinese Studies, who will be having this discussion with Professor Shell today. With that, I will now pass to, to Paul. Okay, uh, Sam, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the time you've put into this. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to spend time uh, with uh, Orville. I wish it was the old fashioned way, face to face with a nice group, but uh, this is also uh, a nice mode and I'm, I'm glad that so many people have signed on. Uh, I love this book. Uh, I strongly urge uh, people to get out and get a copy somehow and, and re read the novel. Uh, it's uh, very challenging, it's, it's terrific. Um, Sam has already mentioned this, but uh, Orville has so many books. Just before our talk, I went into my study and <laughs> I, I almost hurt my back. Uh, there, there are so many books that he's, that he's written and I've, you know, I've read them all and gotten so much out of them. Uh, but uh, uh, incredibly productive uh, a China scholar. Uh, and I'm gonna spend some time today just talking about the novel. But what I wanna start off with, uh, you know, normally uh, we don't mention in a event of this sort, we don't mention, we don't mention the dedication. Uh, and, but I wanna do that here. Uh, the book is dedicated to, uh, uh, by Fang Orville's wife, uh, who I'm extremely sorry to say passed away uh, recently. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to start off this discussion by talking about, about Bai Fang uh, and her ongoing impact on, well, really everything Orville does, but especially this novel. It's more than a dedication. I, I would really like to ask him, start off this session by asking him, you know, to what extent uh, Bai Fang is embedded, the journey that you two had for so long, to what extent is this actually embedded, you know, in uh, the book, uh, uh, you know, that, that, you, that you dedicated to her? Let's, let's start off with that. Well, you know, Paul, I actually started writing this book uh, just before we got married 35 years ago. And I have to say that in a certain sense, when you write a novel, it is a kind of an odyssey. Uh, and it paralleled in very curious and wonderful ways uh, our own life, because what I really wanted to write about was the divide that sort of separates the US and China in so many mysterious and difficult in ways that are difficult to define. So, you know, here she lived on, grew up on one side of the divide. I grew up on the other side of the divide. And in writing this fictional narrative, which is a historical narrative that covers, well, really, uh, you know, 40 years, 50 years almost. Um, you know, she was coming one way across the Pacific, going east to come to America, and I was going the other way, going to China. So it was a tremendously strange sort of yin and yang symmetry. And I, of course, I learned so much about China. I mean, when I think of all the questions I had before I met her and married her, and they become became much more evident, much more uh, sort of illuminated by her life and experience. So I, I don't think I could have written it without her. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I tell you, you, you can feel it in the book. I mean, it's hard to quantify and point to, but there's a, there's a journey, your own personal journey with her, uh, it, it seems to me has a, has a tremendous impact on the, on the novel. Um, and then, uh, I don't know how many of our listeners today have read it. I urge everybody to do that, but I suspect that there'll be a large number who have not read it. Uh, just take a couple of minutes to go over the narrative, the overview, that basically how this story book ended, uh, how, how has it been organized? What's the, you know, what's the essential thrust of the, of the story? Well, I start the story in the late 40s, and I sort of explicitly chose a Chinese who was also a classical musician uh, who studied in America and went back in 1949 to help build a new China and at the new conservatory that Zhou Enlai had set up. And I wanted to sort of combine sort of a bit of East and West in, in that character, the father, and then he has a son, because I felt that, you know, what happened when the revolution hit China was that old cosmopolitan world that really certain places like Shanghai, St. John's University, there were other places where people were deeply imbued with traditional Chinese culture, but they were also comfortable abroad, able to speak a foreign language. And in a certain sense, I think Jiang Kai-shek's government is corrupt as it did get to be, but embody that. You had Christians, you had people who spoke very good English, French, German, whatever. And so I wanted to sort of create such a character and then throw him into the middle of the Mao's revolution and watch what happened and spin a narrative out of that because it struck me that there was so many incredible, what Mao would have called antagonistic contradictions that are very hard to get at in, in nonfiction. So I wanted to do it through things like um, you know, characters, music, literature, art, psychology, all of these sort of woolly topics that we as scholars and writers and reporters have a hard time broaching. Yeah, yeah, so it covers the years, uh, 40 years, as you said, from 1949 to 1989. That's the chronological focus. Um, and um, it really focuses on two individuals. Uh, one, of course, is the dad, uh, Tung Shu, uh, who comes back to China having been studying overseas. And then I think the other character, leading character, and maybe the more important of the two, it's hard to say we can debate, uh, is uh, his son, who is known throughout the novel as Little Li. So I know there are lots of other characters, and we're going to talk about that as we go along. But I, I, would, I would suggest uh, that these are the two major characters that you get to follow pretty much through the whole book. Uh, and that's the time frame. It begins with the revolution in 49 and it ends with uh, uh, Tiananmen, uh, uh, the events surrounding the Tiananmen massacre in 1989. Um, and then the amount of detail, the book is over 600 pages long, this tr tremendous amount of detail. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that really makes it uh, uh, live. You mentioned this quickly, and I'd, I'd like you to return to it if you would. And that is to say this pile of books that I hurt my back bringing in, uh, none of them are works of fiction, they're all reporting, uh, works of standard prose, uh, but this is a work of fiction. So, you know, why, why couldn't you accomplish what you wanted to accomplish in this novel by writing the way you have been writing for, you know, so long ever since the early 1970s? Why, why fiction? You know, there's so many interesting topics that are difficult to plumb in nonfiction, and you kind of know what's going on, but you can't get anybody to say it. And if someone doesn't say it in nonfiction, it's very hard for you to say. Uh, so I, I just, I, I felt like, you know, the area of religion for me is a very interesting one that the communist revolution completely eradicated. So my character is a Christian. So that immediately puts him, you know, contrary with much of what was going on in the revolution. Never mind, he was trained abroad, loves classical music, Bach and that his wife, who's half Chinese and half American, but an American citizen, means that he's immediately suspected after the Korean War and on as being a spy. So all of these things, I just felt um, 
you know, let's let's sort of set this chemical experiment up and put these volatile, uh, you know, opposites in motion and 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 just see what happens that I couldn't really get at uh, in nonfiction. And so for me, it was a kind of a, 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 a desperate effort to, to find another way to plumb what was always so many unanswered questions about what is the fundamental nature of China and, and the revolution and where did it come from and why did it and what happened to people and on and on and on. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did it because uh, I've read all your works in the past and this is different. This feels different. I think the agenda is is different from a lot of the things that you've done, and it does allow you to raise questions and to probe those questions in detail in a way that reporting or normal prose writing doesn't. So that's one of the reasons I recommend the book uh, to people. Uh, you mentioned one of the things that uh, I think probably more than anything else uh, blew me away about this uh, book, and that is the role and function of music. I mean, it is almost on every page. And I've known Orville for a long time, but I must say, I had no idea he knew so much about music uh, and that, that it, was, it was going to be so important in this particular piece of work. Music is absolutely crucial. And I define music in the broadest possible way. It's there throughout them. This is no accident. I discovered this early on uh, as I was reading. Uh, it is an incredible focus, not just on music, but on Bach. Uh, and I just, I knew when I was reading through it that one of the first questions I was going to ask Orville is, you know, why Bach? Because this is, as he pointed out a minute ago, this book is about China, US, divide, you know, back and forth, tensions, okay. And then Bach appears, not on every page, but close to it. Uh, and Bach was not an American, he wasn't Chinese either. So, so more broadly, wh why all the music? And then more specifically, what's up with Bach? Well, I, I love music. I you know played the oboe and I mean, I always adored classical music and it's always been a big part of my life. And when I started to think about it, when I, you know, I sang in the Glee Club at Harvard and, and, and did all these sort of, you know, early polyphony and whatnot. So, but when you think about it, if, you're, if you take Mao Zedong, I mean, just look at his portrait on Tiananmen Square, he's gazing implacably out across the vastness of his creation there. Who in the world of, uh, global history would you say would be the most antithetical person you could think of? And I think it's probably Johann Sebastian Bach. I mean, what was Mao about? So Mao was about uh, overturning everything. He was about reordering the entire world, every aspect of the world, Fanshan, you know, overturn. He was like, uh, you know, make great disorder under heaven. He was not about his soul. He was not about confronting him, his humanity, his mortality, his, his you know, his um, interior side. He was about projecting himself as grandly as he could, remaking China, if not the world, in an exterior fashion. And what was Bach about? Well, when you really listen to Bach, I mean, and if you played or sung in cantatas, you might think the words are kind of irrelevant or not particularly interesting, but he's all about coming to terms with mortality, with your relation to God, and how do you be a, a good human being, and how do you end your life and reach that final heavenly rest, and he's interior. He's like Confucius, yeah. in the sense that Confucius's admonition was, you know, shoshan, Rectify yourself. Rem turn to yourself when there's a problem. Don't go outside and make a revolution. So yeah. I just thought that these two guys, in fact, I was thinking that I would maybe the next thing I ought to do is write a, a my dinner with Andre, but it would be Bach and Mao right. having a conversation. <laughs> what would they talk about? What would they say? I think it would be a fun exercise. So right. that's sort of why I, I, I like him and why I wanted to throw him right into the middle of Tiananmen Square and see if, what, yeah. what kind of a chemical reaction we had. 
Good. I mean, that, that's I, I, I like the way you put that because it will prepare people. Again, we're not going to do any spoilers here, but it will prepare people for the for the function and role of music, but more specifically, the, the role of Bach. Uh, that, and then you already mentioned another thing that I wanted to bring up, and that is, um, you know, initially, uh, you know, we there's some references to missionaries mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Tung Cho is a Christian, you know, OK, but then the theme of religion keeps on coming back. It keeps on coming back. Again, it's not as big as uh, the role of music, although there may be some linkage there in terms of spirituality. I don't know. Anyway, let me throw that at you. Religion. What's going on in the in the in the novel with all of the references to various kinds of religions? Well, think about it for a minute. I mean, to, to, to sort of depart from Johann Sebastian Bach, who was deeply religious. I mean, all almost all of his music was religious music. You know, all his, well, not all his cantatas, some were, were secular. Um, and I think that, you know, again, religion was one of those aspects of Chinese history and the Chinese Communist Revolution, which was inadmissible. Why? Because it emphasized the individual. It emphasized your relation with some higher power, your own moral compass, your own self. And that was very seditious in, 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 in Mao's sort of conception of the kind of new man and new society and new world he was trying to create. So I wanted to put up someone who was not only a lover of music, but who was religious because that was another aspect of Li Tong Shu, the pianist father. And of course his son, doesn't really get religion, although he, it, he does get some of that genetic material just by living with his father, but, and he finds it very difficult to live in China and have his father have this interior, you know, seditious life of believing, uh, of being a believer. So again, these were another one of the things that I wanted to kind of throw into the stew and see what happened because that's what the revolution attacked, mm -hmm. a, a private realm, yeah. which things like music and religion and friendship and love and personal relations, all of these things <laughs> couldn't exist. That, that gets me to my next, uh, <laughs> you set the stage beautifully. Uh, people who are interested in music, you got to read this book. People who are interested in religion, you got to read this book. People who are interested in sex have to read this book. <laughs> because that's another thing that just keeps on coming back. There's a central theme uh, that just, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, uh, it, surprised, it surprised me because it's uh, extremely dynamic in the sense that there is a diversity uh, of uh, uh, sexual expression and so forth. Anyway, I don't want to say too much, but I think you will not disagree with me that this is another th theme that runs through virtually the entirety of the book. And so my question is, why all the sex? Uh, what's going on there? It's not quite as much as music, but it's up there. And I wanted you to, you know, say a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I think if you, th if you ponder what are the key elements of being human, I think you would have to say that there isn't isn't sort of inescapable spiritual craving that most human beings have, and they they find, try to find some expression for that part of their life. They also have a deep desire for something cultural, for some, uh, and that's usually a form of individual expression, at least most prominently in Western culture. And of course, one's uh, one's love of the opposite sex and, and to be together with someone is also an, a fundamental element, it seems to me, of being human. And it was another one of the elements that the revolution did not know how to embrace. Why? Because if you love someone, uh, that means you have a higher loyalty than to Mao and to the party, to the revolution. So in a certain sense, all of these things that you've raised, Paul, I think you're, you're incredibly insightful the way you put the scalpel right in and hit the nerve. Um, they are the most highest expressions of those aspects of human beings which are most individual, most uh, insubordinate and demand to be left alone mm -hmm. by the state society or whatever force outside seeks to control them. So all of these things seem to me to be just 
unavoidable and they were impulses, human impulses that not even Chairman Mao could suppress. Yeah, uh, nice. I like the way you connect these things. They're not separate in the in the novel. They're 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 connected. Uh, the title of the, of the book is My Old Home, uh, and uh, there are two. As we already explained, there are two major lead characters: the father and the son, who we follow through uh, virtually all of the book. Um, but that's two people. And the title is My Old Home, you know, which is singular. It's not our old home. Uh, so there's a search going on for the old home. And it's not clear to me because it's singular who me is, my old home. Is it Tung Chu or is it Little Lee? Um, this search is going on throughout the book. And you intentionally, I think, do not resolve that question. Uh, is the search successful? Is my old home, is it discovered? Is it defined? Uh, we never really find out. Now, feel free to disagree with me if you think, no, no, there's an argument in there. Uh, but is there no home? Are there two homes? Uh, and, and the bridging back and forth. So tell us a little bit more about your choice of title uh, in, in this case. Well, of course, um, My Old Home, Gu Xiang, was the title of a very well-known uh, short story by the wonderful writer from the early 20th century, Lu Xun. Um, and I think what made me want to use it was that he had this notion, and he called it uh, a zhong jian wu, something stuck in the middle. And what he meant by that, in his case, was that he was sort of stuck between a love of tradition and also he abhorred tradition as kind of enslaving China and weakening China and turning it into sort of conservative, uh, the sick man of Asia that couldn't change. And he also loved, he spent a lot of time in Japan. So there was a divide between China and the outside, between tradition and modernity and between many, many different contradictions. And in a certain sense, I wanted to write about how the East and the West, in this case, America and China too, it's a very difficult to divide to navigate because when you start, you can get very easily stuck in the middle too. Mm. And you can't find your old home. Why? Because you become a kind of a cosmopolitan person, which means you're divided in my characters. You know, my young son has to go to America, even though he swears that he'll never come back to China. He does because he saw what China did to his father, his father in the Cultural Revolution. The pianist, he gets his hands hacked with a meat cleaver by the Red Guards and can't play the piano. But he does go back. And it's only to say that I think many people, probably mostly Chinese, but I think some, some Americans and Westerners have the same experience. Once they get hooked, on the other side, they don't, it's a difficult tightrope. How do you combine these two, particularly when they're at war with each other, as we now are, begin to see the US and China again? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I got that feeling. It's about the search, it's about the process of the search. And it's not at all clear how these types of searches, you know, will end up, not only in the case of the figures in the book, but among. The readers, our, our readers. Yeah. Uh, it's about uh, identity. Uh, and, you know, the question of who am I after all? You know, who yeah, where I? do I live? And that's right. Where, can I live on both sides of the divide? You go back and forth, but neither side quite does it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think, again, a really dynamic part of the uh, of the flow of the of the novel. And you know, sometimes I find myself waiting for resolution. I didn't get it, you know, and it, but then I realized, oh, I think that's what he's up to. You're not supposed to get it. It's about the process and about, well, not just the process, but but some of the pain, in, in, in many cases, severe pain uh, involved in the process. And this takes me back to uh, Lu Xun, because, uh, you, you, you know, your favorite writer uh, who was active in China roughly 100 years ago and mine are the same, Lu Xun. He was an extraordinary figure. I still assign his... Uh, his uh, fiction to to my students. Uh, it's just if you haven't read Lu Xun, then you know there's just there's no there's no excuse for that. Uh, so Lu Xun, in some of his work, and you 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 mentioned some of it, 
in the in the novel, uh, there's an issue of what I would call remembering, remembering. And so part of the identity search also involves memory issues. Uh, and memory and remembering is crucial, I think, for all societies. And Lucian made the point, as you indicated uh, in just now, but also in your uh, novel, that remembering, not, it's essential and crucial, but it may be painful. It may be painful, but it is necessary. You still have to do it. Uh, and um, the Chinese party state uh, 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 has for a long time been obsessive about erasing the past. Uh, and, th and that raises the question, you know, why? If Lu Xun is right that we must remember, uh, even if it's painful, and it probably will be painful, whether you're an American, it doesn't matter where you are on earth, there are painful things that need to be remembered. But I guess the question is why? Why is that so important to remember? Well, I think, you know, here, it's interesting, um, more than I think we uh, frequently are willing to acknowledge, we in the West are children of Sigmund Freud. And what's the most sort of fundamental sort of principle that, that underlies his thinking? That you must confront the past. The past lives in every individual. And if it isn't dealt with in some way and put into, into a, a comfortable angle of repose, it can bother you and upturn you and destroy your life. I think there's an element of that that, that applies to history as well. On the other hand, we have the Chinese Communist Party, which does not believe in confronting the past except insofar as its version of it, its right. narrative of the past, which is often distorted and filled with, with uh, manipulations and, and mendacity, uh, is the only thing that you can consider. And it only has one conclusion in their view. So the question of memory, I mean, it's fundamental, to, it seems to me, to almost every kind of literature that, that has any sort of convincing reality principle to it. And yet, this again is something that the Chinese Communist Party has had a hell of a time dealing with it. They don't want to, they don't want to deal with the past because they have had so many travesties that they have committed themselves in the past that if they ever allowed people to freely investigate the past, they would, uh, wouldn't come out looking very well. Yeah. So this is the fundamental question I think that not only my novel seeks to address and answer, or at least raise, it can't answer it, but it's the most fundamental weakness in my view of the Chinese communist system today, which is namely, what is it gonna do with its past? Mm -hmm. Is it just gonna say, let's not talk about it? Let's suffocate it, let's bury it? Well, again, you come back to Sigmund Freud and if you believe as I do, you cannot really f do that and be a healthy society, a healthy individual, a healthy country then then you've got some real problems. So that's why I keep raising memory. No, no, it's crucial. Uh, I mean, I'm an historian, so that's what we do. We do memory. Right. And right. We, just don't, we just don't remember the good stuff and the cool stuff. If you're an historian of the United States, uh, you know, there's a connection between Black Lives Matter and the history of the United States. There's a connection between the Me Too movement and the history of the United States and on and on. Recently, this new wave of anti-Asian uh, hatred. Hey, guess what? There, there's a history there and we need to remember and connect what's happening now to the past. And in the Chinese case, I find way too often the authorities, uh, they're attitude betrays an insecurity and a defensiveness uh, that's, to put it mildly, not healthy. And uh, if I may just add a little further yeah. here, I mean, it is interesting, isn't it, that traditionally, Chinese had a deep and abiding fascination and uh, belief that history had to be recorded and digested. Now, sometimes dynastic histories would write the former dynasty as they wanted to see it. But nonetheless, there was a deep and abiding uh, uh, sense of the importance of history, understanding history, and not letting history just vanish. I agree. So getting back to the novel, uh, this gets me to a question related to what we were just talking about. Uh, there are a couple of places in the book uh, where it's stated point blank by the character that only the foolhardy struggle against the system. 
only yeah. foolhardy. What's wrong with you? You must be a moron. You must be an idiot. What happens to people who struggle against the system? And one of them is uh, Little Lee's wife. Uh, you call her Little Home. Uh, and this is in 1989. And he's wanting to go out into the street and connect with his friends and be involved. Uh, she's at home with their child. Uh, and again, this, this comes up. Only the foolhardy struggle against the system. And uh, the novel makes you struggle with that idea. You know, maybe she's right. Maybe she's right. Uh, uh, and, you know, but it gets into this issue, which I call in my classes, survival strategies. That is to say, um, in a certain kind of situation uh, where it's clear that some are going to survive, some are not going to survive, um, what are we all capable of doing you know, whether it was the McCarthy period in U.S. history or all these moments that you cover in your novel, what are we all capable of doing, whether we like to believe it or not, in order to survive? So what about that idea that, that you have a couple of characters in different places uh, uh, quoting, you know, it's, it's only the foolhardy struggle against the system? I mean, I think it's undeniably true that you have to be a really tough cookie to want to frontally take on the Chinese Communist Party in almost any period of history. Now, 1980s, it was somewhat different. You could, you could do that. But most other times, it was very, very difficult. And then the people I know who have taken them on, people like Liu Xiaobo or Wei Jingsheng or you know, Fang Liju, these people, they were really unique. And boy, they were tough. And there is a cost to that. So one can, has to have a certain sympathy for people who say, listen, I just want to live. I want to, whatever little narrow margin of life, the party, the government, the state, society affords me, I want to live. I don't want to make trouble and get smashed down and be destroyed. And I think that is the history, not just of, of communist China, but to a certain degree, imperial China as well. People learned their place and they kept it and they, they tried to live. So I think there's a long sort of tradition of this in China, but yep. there are always those few people, those idealists who say, no, this isn't right. And I think that tradition perhaps is stronger in the West because we've allowed it and we've supported it and we've written constitutions to underlay and, and, and buoy up people who want to go out and say, no, this is wrong uh, and allow them to be indignant and to be reform-minded. Final yeah. thought, I mean, it is sort of odd, isn't it, that in the society where people have, you know, that expression in Chinese, when you raise the past, you know, be a shuola, don't talk about it. Uh, but that, you know, Mao Zedong was one of the great rebels who somehow arose within the society, but he too was one of these incredibly tough, savage, no-nonsense people. He opposed the old system and look what it, made him be. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, to change the mood a little bit, um, it's also true that there's a lot of funny stuff in this book uh, that, you know, I mean, humor, I hope. <laughs> humor. <laughs> uh, because again, that's part of the human condition. Uh, that uh, there's a lot of this you know, very grim stuff and painful stuff on both sides of the Pacific Ocean, uh, but also um, you know, there's, there's, there's stuff that there are points in the book where you burst out laughing. Uh, I, have to, I have to quote one item. So the little Lee, as uh, we know, and this is not a spoiler, this, this doesn't give anything away, but he, he goes to the United States. Uh, this is Tung Shu's son. He goes to the United States and, and spends a period of time there and he makes friends and so forth. And one of his uh, dearest friends is a young woman in San Francisco. Surprise, surprise, Oval includes San Francisco and Berkeley quite often in this novel. Uh, so this is Juliet. Uh, and I love the name. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, you know, little Lee wants to know. You know, yeah, you seem to you seem to know a lot about China. You know, how 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 did you learn about China? You've never really been, you know, you haven't been to Asia or China. And I'm going to quote now from the book. She said, "Some American guy uh, who did a series for the magazine about all the changes going on over there that ended up in a book entitled to Get Rich Is Glorious.'" <laughs> 
So oh. Juliet is, uh, you know, educating herself by reading things written by Orville Schell. And uh, he doesn't, you know, the Orville Schell's name is not mentioned, but as, a, as someone who read that book myself, I burst into laughter when I saw that. Uh, another thing that I, I want you to comment on, if you would, because I think this is also uh, one of the, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, it it's, it's a euphoric, uh, segment of the book in some ways. Uh, so Little Lee, when he's a young kid, basically, like so many we know uh, in the Cultural Revolution period, is sent down to the countryside, sent out you know, to places that were completely unknown to him. And there's quite a bit of attention in the book to his time. He was sent to Qinghai province, uh, which is uh, out west uh, all sorts of different interesting people live there, but included among them are the Golaks, who are nomadic people uh, with links to Tibetan uh, society and culture. Uh, and it's incredible the extent to which he not only bonds with these people, uh, but that the account that you give of these people uh, there's something again going on here. This is not just a passing thing. Uh, it's uh, an idyllic account, a romantic account. Um, it's very, the people and their way of life uh, is made to look very, very attractive. Um, it's a, a view of what I would call the, the natural life of these people. Uh, and in some ways, it's the only place in the whole book where we see a people who are whole. They're not rich, they're not, I mean, but they got their act together, they're whole. Uh, and it reminded me immediately, you know, going back to my <laughs> youth in the 1960s, it reminded me of a 1960s type hippie commune, you know, where you just, you, you wanted to bond with people, you wanted to blend in, uh, there was trust, there was solidarity. Uh, the values that you're so concerned with throughout this book are found so deeply embedded uh, in these uh, people that Little Lee encounters in Qinghai, and it has an impact him, on him that I think, uh, so what's going on there? Why, why are you spending so much time on these people in China who are not Han Chinese, they live out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, why are we spending so much time with them? What's the contribution to the narrative? Well, as a, you know, he's a 15, 16 year old boy. He got, gets sent out as an educated youth in Qinghai, one of the most remote provinces in China, of course, where there are myriad uh, reform through labor, reform through education camps, but it also is a Tibetan ethnic area. And as it happened, um, I went out there when China opened up very early in 1980, 81. I was on the first mountain climbing trip that went to Qinghai to, to, to uh, ascend one of the, the tallest peaks. Uh, and I did come into contact with these Golok, these uh, pastoral nomadic Tibetan tribesmen. And so I got sort of interested in them. And I guess the, the point of his reconnoitering with them out there, he gets sent out there to a way station in the middle of absolute nowhere to work on a road. And there's nothing there. And he's a poor young boy, utterly bereft of family. And, uh, and he takes his flute with him because he plays the flute and he works in a quarry and he plays and is, you know, in, in, when he's eating his lunch and slowly these nomads start coming to listen to him. And so he gets acquainted with them and he goes and they live in these yak hair tents and they're pastoral nomads that go up into high pasture in the summer and down in the winter. Anyway, this is a kind of a refuge for him. Yep. And it is strangely a part of society that despite the vicissitudes of the uh, cultural revolution does remain largely intact. Yep. Families stay together, their life stays together. They, they herd sheep, yak and sheep and he finds a refuge there yeah. and he's deeply sort of uh, bonds with them. Yeah. So you're right, it is a strange, um, and then I have to say, although I maybe, I hope I haven't done this, there is a long tradition as you know in Tibetan art, I mean in Chinese art literature to romanticize the Tibetans, the lovely polyandrous, color, colorful, you know, free nomads of the Tibetan plateau. But 
I think for him, it's it's real. They yeah. take him in, they care for him, and that's his only human relations of consequence during a 10-year exile. Yeah, no, I, I think it's uh, a crucial part of the book. The book would be different if you didn't have, if you had him sent down to some place in Hebei or Shandong. Uh, okay, lot, that happened to lots of people, but I think that placing it there uh, plays uh, a, a, a special role, uh, especially when you consider now, you know, what's going on in uh, Xinjiang. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are, these are people who are citizens of China, but they're not Han Chinese. They have their own culture, their own language, uh, and so forth. And the need to, this is not about the remembering issue so much as the uh, respecting uh, and learning from and uh, being able to interact with peoples who are from very different cultures. And I know uh, uh, from another one of your books, the Virtual Tibet book, uh, that uh, you, you, know, you know the Dalai Lama. Uh, we've had him here a couple of times. Uh, and uh, oh, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> you heard. You heard that, did you? I think there were some other people you know, who heard about that too. Uh, anyway. Um, so uh, anyway, I, again, without doing any spoiling, uh, I think this is a part of the book that uh, it connects your own experiences in China to a narrative that would be different without that episode. We need to understand that there are millions and millions of people in China who are not Han Chinese, uh, and they have their own culture and language, and they have an impact. They, hey, guess what? They can even they can have an impact on Little Lee. They can have an impact on Old Rochelle, uh, and and we need to we need to you know, work, work that out. Um, very, uh, please answer this quickly, because I want to move on to our final question. Uh, but um, what do you think, this is, this is unfair in some ways, but let me just pop it on you. Um, what's going to surprise people the most about this, about this novel? Uh, you know, it, what, what do you imagine in your readership? And I'm thinking especially of people who don't know a great deal about China, may have never traveled there or read much about it, but they have some whatever, you know, stereotypic or other kinds of views of, of China, then they read your book. Um, what do you think might be one of the surprises? Not necessarily that you planned it this way, but uh, that you can imagine a surprise of the following sort. You know, I think very often when we Americans uh, look at China and Chinese, we can't see clearly what, what, what's going on there. It seems very opaque, whether it's politics, even, you know, when I first started, just how people interacted, how they related. I'm hoping that, you know, this will sort of pull back the, the tarpaulin on and, and to, to show that there our fundamental characteristics of human beings and things they want, things they care about. They care about their children. They care about religion. They care about music. They care about a lot of things which aren't, when, when you and I started studying China and when we first went to China, there wasn't one scintilla of evidence that that was the case. We couldn't see it. Even though we looked very hard, we were not allowed to see it and Chinese could not share it with us. And yet it was going on. And it's going on today, even though it's not always possible to see the full dimensions of what they think, what they believe, what they want, their criticisms. And it's only to say that the Chinese Communist Party very often makes the Chinese people seem quite not inhuman, but unhuman mm -hmm. to us because we can't see clearly. So God willing, that's something a novel can do. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, and I think it will have different kinds of impacts on different kinds of readers. And again, that's good. Uh, and, uh, you know, my own feeling was that uh, I like the kind of writing that doesn't hit you over the head with, you know, here's what you have to believe now that you've read this. Here's, here's the takeaway. I'd rather be forced to struggle. Here's, here's a narrative. You, you know, you deal with it. What it what, it's going to have a different impact on different people. So again, this is why I suggest people read it. Now, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next four or five minutes on a really big question. Uh, but I think it's time for viewers to begin to send questions into uh, Sam, if you haven't already done that, haven't already begun to begin to pose questions. Because with about 10 minutes to go, we want to have uh, Orville deal with some of those questions. Um, we want questions that are that are 
brief and, and so forth. We want to hear as many of your voices as possible through Sam and get Orville to comment. Whether you've read the book and have questions and comments or you haven't read the book and based on what he said, you have questions or comments. So please start sending those in. Meanwhile, the last question I want to deal with in the final four or five minutes here is you could not have planned this. Uh, there's no way to know what's coming down the road six months, a year from now, a year and a half from now. But the book has come out during an incredible low point in US-China relations. Uh, and again, we've been through this before. I can remember higher points and lower points. And you know, it, 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 it waxes and wanes in terms of the relations uh, between the two places, this place called China, this place called the United States. Uh, but let's face it, the book is coming out, uh, has come out at a time of, uh, it's actually depressing, you know, to read the paper, to see what's going on uh, in, in, in the relations between uh, the, two, the two places. Um, and it made me wonder, because your book is all about the bridge. Your, your book is all about that complicated bridge that has holes in it and you can fall through if you're not careful and it's not easy to move across that bridge or come back across that bridge. Uh, but let's face it, we had horrific relations at one time with Japan. We had horrific relations one time with Germany, but we have dynamic uh, relationships with those places today. Uh, and, and so I think nothing is cut in stone and unchangeable, but it makes me worry sometimes that, you know, the kinds of wounds that you describe in the novel uh, that aren't just about the history of China or the history of the United States, but this, the, 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 the bridging phenomenon that you talk about, there are all sorts of wounds associated with that that are described in the novel. And it makes me wonder, will it, you know, what do you think? Will it ever be possible to heal the wounds that are described in China? Will it ever be possible for the United States and China to have a compatible, stable, and high quality relationship of the sort that we have now with Japan and Germany, who were mortal enemies, uh, you know, in the lifetimes of both you and me, uh, you know, you know, is, is it hopeless? In, in, in other words, do you worry that the takeaway from people reading your novel uh, might be, wow, this is this is hopeless. We're just, you know, we're, we're, we're there's no way out. Uh, and even to the point where I mean, when I read the papers someday, not only do I worry about worsening relations or problematic relations getting better instead of worse, I actually worry about military conflict. I mean, it's not, I mean, again, please disagree with me if you feel that way, but reading the paper, I don't, I don't rule out, I wish I could, but reading the newspaper and watching TV, it seems like uh, that's something that could happen. Military conflict could happen. It could, I think, relatively easily happen over Taiwan, you know, issues related to Taiwan. Anyway, I don't want to run on too long there, but your book has come out in a very interesting sociopolitical international context in the relations between the U.S. and China. So uh, please share your, your own feelings about what's going on now uh, in, the, in the bilateral relations. Well, I think, I mean, I'm too extremely worried by what I, I see happening between the US and China. And I, I, I think more than at any time in the past few decades, the chances of some military clash, perhaps starting accidentally, is real. That said, um, I mean, I think we are all, in a way, children of engagement, which was a sort of promising scenario of the two sides over time slowly coming together and converging. I think that's now past. That dream is not, not viable given who uh, Xi Jinping is and his aspirations for China. I think the strange thing, if you look at the future and try to prognosticate about the US and China, and, and actually about the characters that I tried to depict in my novel, is that the two peoples, countries, societies actually have incredibly deep affections and, and fascinations with each other. They also have incredibly deep points of disagreement, animosity, 
and sort of irritability between them that have historically manifested themselves in different ways. So it's a kind of a curious, um, uh, you know, uh, oscillating pulse of love and hate, togetherness, separateness. And I don't know, and I think right now, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party are just very dangerously playing with all of the sort of negative aspects historically of the relationship and nationalism. So I'm very worried. And I think in a certain sense, you know, when I started writing this, lo, those many decades ago, the relationship was much better, but still yeah. there were differences. And now I feel like it's, it's prescient in a certain way to have chosen this topic of the divide and people not being able to live on both sides comfortably because we're headed back into, I mean, you call it whatever you want, a cold war, a near cold war or something else. It's not good. Yeah. And we're exaggerating our differences rather than our similarities. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm quite fearful about what could happen in such a circumstance. Okay, so we're right on time. Uh, so Sam, I'd like to uh, ask you to, uh, <clears throat> Uh, throw out questions that have come in, uh, and uh, we'll we'll do that for a time, and, and then we'll wrap it up right on the hour. Sure. We have a question from our director, Lei Guang. Orvo, on your East-West comments, it's easy for us to think about China and the U.S. in simple economist terms. How do you deal with the real cultural differences without falling into the trap of binary cultural categories? Uh, second part of the question, if you have time, how do you find transition from one mode of writing, nonfiction, to another, uh, such as fiction? Do you feel liberated in fiction writing or more exacting? Well, let's deal with the last one first. I mean, it is not an easy matter to, uh, to kind of reassign yourself to, to uh, fiction from nonfiction, because in nonfiction, you, you're always trying to tell the truth and have pe and, and say what people say. And, and in fiction, you know, as Camus said, fiction is the great lie by which we tell the truth. So <laughs> you have to go into an entirely different gear and stress narrative and character and description. And you have to, you have to be humorous and human and all these things, which we don't have to be in nonfiction. So suffice it to say, that's difficult. Now, your first question was what? Uh, uh, Lei Guang's first question? Um, how do you uh, make sure you don't dichotomize U.S. China in simple terms? How do you deal with the real cultural differences? Oh boy, um, you know, in my view, we have to be very careful to separate out what's a cultural difference and what's a political difference. I mean, the Communist Party is, is always saying, well, it's natural, we have cultural differences. Well, in my view, the Communist Party is not a culture although it is a culture, and it's to be distinguished from Chinese culture. It's a different kind of a, a, of a culture, and it is a very a, a pernicious kind in many ways, in my view. And so that's an important distinction to make. Yes, there are differences, but political and ideological differences are different than cultural differences. I think we can live with the cultural differences and have, but the other ones which have fundamental disagreements over themes such as freedom, liberty, tolerance, you know, equality, et cetera, et cetera. Those are, again, what I think Chairman Mao would have called antagonistic contradictions. And I don't know how to reconcile them myself. I don't think they're reconcilable. Thanks. Um, we're waiting for more questions. Please use the Q&A box. While we're waiting, I can um, just piggyback on Lay's question and asking if Orvo has Anybody approach you yet in terms of adapting your novel to either theater or film? I've been personally very encouraged by just the renaissance of both Asian American filmmaking and also Mondoan's you know, storytelling and in the spirit of bridging and the spirit of trying to really tell the truth of the human condition through new medium and new forms of storytelling. Do you envision your book here being adapted to theater or film someday? Well, uh, every novelist likes to imagine that they've written the, the perfect fic piece of fiction for a film script. And in, in many ways, I think this has tremendously obvious um, filmic 
uh, uh, advantages. However, <laughs> there's a huge however coming here. I think there isn't a snowball's chance in hell you could shoot it in China or show it in China. And if you can't shoot it in China, you can't shoot it. There's no way to recreate Beijing or Qinghai or any of the other sort of iconic places, which would be absolutely essential in a film like this. So I think it's doomed to remain in print for the near future. Thanks. We have another question. You said you started writing 35 years ago, a novel that spans so many decades. Do the main ideas you started change? Yes, because when I started, I mean, the 1980s were an incredibly hopeful period where everybody, both in China and outside of China, was sort of filled with optimism about Chinese reform and the Chinese, China would slowly become more soluble in the outside world. And there was great affection and, and foundations were running off to China and congressional delegations and everybody wanted to help and businesses. And, and then, you know, 1989 hit. And that was a terrible disaster for US-China relations. And yet, Jiang Zemin, who many people at the time, and I would say myself violated this, 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 this myself, thought of him as rather clownish and buffoon-like. But in actuality, as I look back on him now, I see him as someone who resurrected a large measure of reform and was very eager to see China become closer to the US and Europe and other countries. And then um, that came the cropper with Xi Jinping. So I, I think um, that, but you have to remember that whatever you see of China at the present is not the China of the future. And I, when I went to first in 1975, I spent several months there working and Mao was still alive and the cultural revolution was still going. I thought that was China at interna but it wasn't. A few years later, Deng Xiaoping heaved to and look what happened. So you know, China is a deeply unresolved place and it has all sorts of opposites contending. And I wager that process will continue to manifest itself in the years to come. And we have no idea where it'll ultimately end up and maybe things will improve again. Thanks. Uh, we have one more question here. It might be time, only time for this last one. And, uh, Basically, are you going to have a sequel? Uh, you would see your book extend beyond 1989. How would you see the ending being different? Well, you know, when I came to the ending, and you'll see, I won't give it away. It looks like it sort of does end in 1989. But if you read it carefully, you'll see that I've artfully left the prospect open that, that something could go on. But frankly speaking, I'm not sure I have another 35 year labor in me uh, to write a sequel, and may maybe, but I had a wonderful time doing this, but boy, I want to tell you, I've never spent so much time on a book and, and I've enjoyed every step of the way. And it's been, I've been I'm fortunate to have a wonderful editor and whatnot, but um, not easy work writing a, a novel that covers such a sweep of history. Thanks so much, Orville. I think we're out of time here. Um, I just wanted to invite everybody to uh, come to our next webinar. Um, before that, definitely go and get Orvo's book. Uh, I also learned that it's actually also in audio version. So either read or hear uh, Orvo's book. And then our um, next webinar is with um, one of the newest faculty hired at GPS, Kyle Hanley, who will be uh, talking about the fall and rise of US-China policy uncertainty. With that, I'll turn it back over to Paul to close this out. Yes, uh, let me just take uh, 30 seconds. I want to uh, thank Orville uh, for uh, joining us today. Uh, it was a wonderful session. I enjoyed uh, the interplay back and forth. Uh, I am going to ask Sam to come over to my house later today to help me you know, get these books back into my study. I've got a whole, a whole shelf dedicated to Orville's books, but this is the one that uh, I'm saying people need to go out and get uh, and read through it. Uh, you will definitely be challenged 
uh, and uh, uh, this this dialogue that we that we uh, initiated today, you know, will continue uh, in in your own mind if you if you dig into this book. So, Orville, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, all of your efforts, and uh, let's be let's be back in touch soon. Good. Well, thank you, Paul. It was a lot of fun, and thank you, Sam. Thank you, Orville. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everybody.